Good afternoon, everyone, again. Uh, my name is Martin Fink, Chair in uh, Citizenship Studies here at the European University Institute. Um, and um, welcome, everybody, again. Uh, also, for those of you who are listening to this uh, online, when the, um, the uh, talk will be uh, posted on, um, on our uh, YouTube channel uh, later. Um, to the uh, Global C Citizenship Annual Conference 2022, and I'm... Um, I'm truly delighted to introduce to you the keynote speaker of our annual conference, uh, Professor Sarah Wallace Goodman. Uh, Sarah Goodman is professor of political science at the University of California, Irvine. Um, her research examines citizenship and the shaping of political identity through immigrant integration. Sarah is a longstanding Global CIT friend, I think we can say, and collaborator, actually from the earlier uh, years of Global CIT and its uh, predecessor, Udo Citizenship. Um, Sarah is an extremely prolific uh, author, and um, this year she has uh, published um, uh, um, this book, uh, Citizenship in Hard Times, and um, it's maybe saying the obvious that this is an extremely well-timed uh, publication. We are living in, um, in hard um, democratic times uh, for sure, um, so I, I uh, very much recommend everyone to, to read this great book. Um, but she not only published uh, one book um, in 22, but actually a second book, um, also extremely uh, timely. Uh, she's co-author of the book Pandemic Politics, The Deadly Toll of Partisanship in the Age of COVID, uh, published with Princeton University Press. Um, previously, she has published with, with uh, Cambridge UP, uh, Immigration and Membership Politics in Western Europe, for which she was awarded the Best Book Award by the American Political Science Association. Uh, she published her work in major political science and migration studies journals, and her research has been influential beyond academia and cited in major news outlets such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, and Vox. Um, in her talk, Sarah will address the topic of citizenship and the democratic moment, and she will speak for about 30, 35 minutes, um, followed by about um, 20 minutes uh, Q&A. So I'm really excited uh, that you are here. Sarah, thanks a lot for, for joining us and we look forward to your talk. Thank you very much for having me. And I like your aspirational timeline of how long this talk is going to be. I'm a very sp fast speaker, so I'm going to deliberately try and slow down my cadence uh, for this audience. Um, so it is a true pleasure to be here. Uh, we have really run the gamut today in topics from eligibility to access. Um, and I think that my uh, talk really serves as a nice bookend to uh, Martin's uh, comments at the very beginning. So I'm kind of gonna bring us back to the discussion of access and uh, citizenship policy. Um, but uh, before I do, I, I have just a few kind of preliminary thoughts. Um, I think this is the golden age of studying citizenship. Uh, there have never been more people doing more studies in more countries, and this room is very much a testament to that, um, and never with more uh, care and precision. And I think that uh, the diversity of individuals in this room is really inspiring, um, and Global Cit has been a real leader in the field uh, uh, in terms of harnessing the intellectual and the theoretical uh, and the empirical contributions. So, I feel very honored uh, to be with you uh, all tonight. Um, so I wanted to take this opportunity. Uh, I'm kind of cursed with that, uh, I guess, uh, affliction where once you publish something, you never want to talk about it again. So I'm actually not going to talk about my published work. And I want to share with you uh, some reflections I have on the field of citizenship studies um, in the hopes that uh, we can kind of pool our collective, our interdisciplinary interests uh, together to push forward a generative uh, and comparative research agenda. So uh, as Martin says, I'm a political scientist and my main tools are comparative tools. Uh, and I'm uh, very interested in building sort of a common terminology uh, framework for uh, pushing the field forward. Um, so uh, let me start at the beginning uh, and that that comprises of two experiences um, during the pandemic that shaped the ideas that I present uh, here. So the first uh, was the pandemic itself. Um, attempting intellectual growth in isolation is hard and I give everybody kudos for having produced work. Um, 
after these hard years. Uh, we may be solo authors of papers and books, but we do not work in solitude. We are part of communities and I miss the opportunity to learn and grow from all of you in uh, these past years. So uh, again, when I say it's a pleasure to be here, I, I really mean it. Um, thank you for being here as well. Uh, the pandemic, of course, was a condition that facilitated the second experience. Uh, as I was on my own, I had the opportunity to really reflect a lot on the field, uh, where it's come, where we are, where we're going. Um, I reread basically everything uh, in preparation for an article that I have that's uh, forthcoming in the Annual Review of Political Science. Uh, so in that piece, I identify uh, several areas where the field has excelled, so namely, uh, determinants of citizenship policy, the consequences of citizenship policy, and the consequences of citizenship, that is the utility of obtaining citizenship. Um, but there are also areas where I identify knowledge saturation, responding to data availability and disciplinary incentives, uh, and some ample areas for growth. And I wanna focus on the latter tonight. Uh, so I have ideas for moving the field forward together. Uh, now, on the one hand, I don't, think that I need to tell you some of this stuff because uh, your work here is the frontier. And I think that all the opportunities for growth kind of lie in this room. Um, so these comments really aim to integrate the field because uh, I think I see movement in two directions. On the one hand, we see a exporting of Western concepts to new cases. So part of my talk will be about how we use concepts that were born from the Western European experience and try to apply them widely. So this is Martin asked me, who's the villain of my talk? So we all are in a sense, but you and I together. So this is a mea culpa as much as it is anything else. Um, so first is the kind of how we export concepts. And the second is about how we import uh, new cases into existing theory or build new theory altogether. Uh, so it is again, in part a mea culpa and part a stream of consciousness, so bear with me. Okay, so the talk is structured by three perhaps provocative observations toward the goal of field integration. So the first is on exporting concepts. We need more conceptual discipline. Uh, I think we're at a critical moment in citizenship studies and as we expand to more cases, more time periods, more country year observations, more precision and dimensions of citizenship. Uh, we need to make sure we don't lose sight of what it is that we are studying, uh, whether it's the same thing at the same levels of analysis across cases. Uh, the second is on kind of importing cases is I think we have a paucity of theoretical accumulation. Uh, we have never known more on empirical in empirical terms Yet we have not, as a field, advanced our theory much. And I think it's primarily because of our failure to integrate kind of non-Western European cases into theory building exercises. And then the third observation uh, is uh, there is kind of vast uh, mechanistic neglect. Uh, so we still lack a nuanced understanding of how citizenship operates. Uh, I think we make a lot of assumptions in our studies that it's timing, it's socialization, it's exposure, uh, sticks and carrots. Um, but we have tools in our fields, our respective fields, the, to start rigorously examining the conditions of how different tool, different policy settings work. Um, and again, by we, I include myself in these critiques. So they're both general observations and critical reflections. Um, and I think a lot of the papers here today kind of already illustrate how I think the work in this room is moving the field in a really generative and progressive direction. So I'm so excited and privileged to be here. Okay, so on the, I called it the ethical exportation on conceptual discipline, essentially, it's about concept stretching. A lot of what we know about concepts and theories and practices of citizenship is a function of the cases we select. Um, as, so, as USATAC became UTOSIT, became GlobalSIT, so too should we push ourselves to think explicitly about the concepts that we're measuring, their portability across regions, and the extent to which our concepts, namely citizenship and integration, uh, our theories, to so the extent to which the theories we use to support them are essentially European in nature. Okay, so does citizenship mean the same thing in Southeast Asia as it does in Western Europe? Is the practice of citizenship in China at the meso level with its HUCO um, household registration system, is it equivalent to national citizenship in other states as both a designator of rights and membership? Of course not, the answer is no. Uh, we know they're not the same. 
So, uh, you know, the inclusionary liberal European account of citizenship is marked by membership struggles over status, rights, duties, how we define a political community. We heard some of that today. Um, and naturalization into national citizenship in Europe is significant and consequential. Uh, Chinese uh, hukou, on the other hand, extends education, employment, healthcare, housing, geographic mobility, um, based at the city residency. So while China's 25 million or so right, floating population has national citizenship, I mean, Taiwanese have national citizenship, um, their lack of urban uh, hukou limits access to meaningful rights and services at the most basic form. So naturalizing into national citizenship is not significant in the same way. Uh, citizenship in these two cases are not the same. So even comparing access to status and rights by obtaining say Swiss citizenship with its cantonal features, uh, we're not talking about the same thing. Um, so even if they're scored the same, for instance, the same level of difficulty, right? In a cross-national global citizenship data database. So this assumption comes from two places, right? This assumption of equivalence, it comes from two, I think two sources. One is sort of just the practices we've been doing in the field, uh, the quantitative studies that operationalize citizenship policy cross nationally and over time. Um, and I say that as someone who uses, reads, cites and contributes to this literature. Um, the shared terminology doesn't do us favors, I think for comparing these very different types of citizenship. Um, that's not to say we shouldn't strive for large end studies, uh, particularly when it comes to theorizing the role of citizenship access. But this is an invitation that we all think carefully and act deliberately about how we use concepts um, in moving from um, analysis uh, to implications. Uh, so, and the second source I think of this assumption of equivalent um, of equivalence comes from uh, the origins of citizenship itself, right? That um, the concept is inherently born in Western Europe of the Westphalian system. So as we have this international state system, I won't go sort of into this uh, further, uh, but how much of our understanding of labeling vis-a-vis -vis the state and citizen, vis-a-vis -vis citizenship and, and the state and the post-Westphalian international state system is effectually European. So this is a question I won't answer. And I think a lot of the papers here have already begun to tackle it from taking on post-colonial and non-Western uh, perspectives for thinking about the state, or I should say the individual polity relationship. Okay, so for our purposes, I think the most worrying consequence of concept stretching uh, when it comes to citizenship uh, to non-Western, non-Westphalian contexts is that it often takes with it the implicit assumption that citizenship is a signifier of national identity and belonging. Um, so again, we, so we heard a number of papers today, I think that already show, illustrates how we can we challenge this notion of citizenship as national belonging, right? So citizenship as a political identity may not be very salient in several cases because one, it doesn't align with prior identities, two, it doesn't supplant those identities, and three, simply not enough time has passed to allow for one and two to take place. So we use very short timelines to assess what took a country's centuries to accomplish, um, right? It took. 200 years for peasants to become Frenchmen to invoke uh, Eugen Weber's uh, title, but we kind of still confidently make comparisons between say the French model and I think kind of newer instantations of nation state building. Um, so uh, how does citizenship as a national membership category work in non-Western post-colonial contexts where traditional categories of culture, kinship, community relations, group identities proliferate? Uh, so, I think we can easily see how this works when we look at other cases. So like the India case is really perfect. And I, I really enjoyed uh, your paper because I think you make this point um, very succinctly. So um, I read uh, Niraja Gopal Jayal's book on citizenship and its discontents. So um, which I think makes a very similar point here, but I'll, let me just briefly quote. So she writes, unlike in countries such as the United States or in the United Kingdom, where histories of citizenship had entailed struggles for institutionalizing inclusion, the Indian Republic started life already equipped with it. So we have different understandings of how citizenship is used to create national belonging, whether it reflects or constructs it. And I think that that, that is a meaningful part of the concept to carry through to the analysis um, that we often kind of drop off when we um, assume kind of a unit homogeneity here. 
Um, my colleague, uh, Kamal Sadiq, writes similarly that uh, in the scramble to ensure national territorial integrity, otherwise stable heterogeneous communities were arbitrarily, socially, and geographically re-engineered to match the political envisionings of a modern nation state. So citizenship in, in both of these examples, the same case here, did not create meaningful national identity, rather it obscured meaningful pre-existing differences. And, you know, of course, it's still too early to tell. It hasn't even been one whole century, right? Um, to tell if, uh, if the French timeline is anything to uh, go off of theoretically uh, for this case. So let me get to the bottom line when it comes to concepts here. I think national citizenship is not always a marker of national belonging. Um, I think we heard many examples today to, to support that. Um, and it's citizenship is not also uh, always a meaningful designator of rights. It is, however, always a status, at least. It may be an ineffectual one, but it establishes legibility uh, to the state, to invoke James Scott's term. Um, and I think that is the least we can say for cross-national comparability. So we usually hedge around, hedge around this conceptual ambiguity by saying that citizenship is an essentially contested concept, but it isn't really. It's just a multi-dimensional one. And I think it's just maintaining clarity about what our scope conditions are, uh, how we move from one dimension to another, um, and to be exceptionally careful in our, in our work uh, when we use it and how. It seems that the most damaging element of that is the membership uh, assumption um, in caring to new cases. Okay, so if the first observation, what, how, are we, how are we doing on time? Okay. So if the first assumption uh, or observation, I should say, is about, um, using care and exporting concepts. Uh, the second is an appeal to integrate new casework into theory. So I said, I called it the, the paucity of theoretical accumulation, which is just a fancy way of saying we don't know a lot yet. Um, so what theories do we have in comparative citizenship of policy change or continuity or restriction or inclusiveness, right? A lot of our theories emerge from paired comparisons or single case studies which um, should make us cautious about claims of external validity, but does not mean that general theory is impossible. Uh, what is required in a careful marriage between contextual knowledge, so area studies, uh, and cross-national research and the tools that they use, um, be it observational, causal inference, right? So what's required is really an explicit scoping of conditions. So this is now the second time that I've had that appeal. Um, I think the field here is uniquely situated for this challenge where both inter it's both interdisciplinary and multi-method in that respect that I think we are well poised to make um, uh, for generation in this area. Okay, so what do we know so far when it comes to general theory and citizenship? Most explanations for citizenship policy change that is general um, is rooted in electoral politics. So uh, Yopke, for instance, Christian Yopke, for instance, right, influentially identifies the role of left governments pursuing de-ethnicization and right governments pursuing re-ethnicization. This is a finding that's sort of echoed in the field with regard to the role of nativist parties. Um, uh, Solo, Doc, and Summers also find, like, on the, just as true on the right, is also we see on the left with respect to social democratic and socialist parties who are associated with liberalization. Uh, in their work, they're talking specifically about use solely. Um, so related, there's work on courts, there's work on uh, growth of immigrant electorates on the role of public opinion. Um, but of course, all these theories are confined, confined to advanced democracies. Um, this is all to say that there is potential, there are potential explanations for citizenship policy uh, in looking beyond electoral or democratic politics or the handful of the usual cases that are tried and true comparisons. So the general underrepresentation of the global South in theory building and in general theory in particular invites us to think more inductively and comparative about general theory. Uh, for instance, right? So studies uh, that take feminist or critical perspectives center concepts like racial and stratified citizenship. So here I found uh, Mahmoud Mamdani's work really influential in writing about the rise of hierarchical identity-driven membership in post-colonial Africa. Um, ethnic, racial, or nationality-based citizenship, he writes, was inevitable uh, because rather than uh, unite natives under a common equal constitution or law, imperial powers cemented and politicized customary, uh, religious, indigenous, and traditional law, further segmenting populations. Um, so this is essentially a simple invitation 
um, for us to integrate more non-European cases into theory building. Uh, it's a really simple way of putting it. Um, so instead of citizenship producing togetherness, uh, so not homogeneity, but community, which is a, sort of an underlying kind of theory of society that I, I think operates on, citizenship operates by in Western Europe. So instead of citizenship producing a, a togetherness in which alienation is the out, out, outlier, imagine if we start from a theoretical prior that citizenship is hierarchical and does not produce equality, but replicates and exacerbates inequalities. I could imagine really robust, interesting studies of like tried and true cases that starts from a different theory of citizenship that imagines it as not a device of unity, but as a, uh, uh, a tool of, of, of perpetuating uh, hierarchies. Um, so it's really kind of the exact opposite of T.H. Marshall's teleological rights realization, I think. Uh, it allows us to center inequalities. Um, it also fundamentally reimagines what we think integration is uh, and how we measure it. So this speaks to kind of a related point about theorization, which is actually when I actually, when I talk about democracy. So I was going to get there, but the title was a bit of a filler. Um, so context matters a lot. I know that's not... It sounds really obvious, but I want to talk about the ways specifically that we can think about context and theory building. Um, so, and I, and I really, like, I enjoyed today's presentation so much because they really pick up on both of these points. So there's really two contexts that can play a meaningful role in thinking about citizenship theory, right? That they're independence or foundational moments, as I, I write about them here, um, and democracy. So... Foundational moments. So for instance, inductive casework reveals really different uses of like use solely. I just like pick a policy, right? Um, given different challenges at state, at state foundational moments. So if we think about how states use use solely at these different foundational moments, we see that there's a lot of different ways that you can use the same policy. And some of these papers already talked about this today, right? So you think about India, uh, I'm gonna let me just at their first constitutions, right? So India, 1950, Indonesia, 1945, both are early adopters of use solely and in and easy naturalization rules, right? But not because they wanted to be inclusive and to incorporate outsiders, but because they were faced with sort of the fundamental first tasks of state building, which is making populations legible. Um, answering questions like who are the citizens? Who is the state responsible for and accountable to? From whom can we extract taxes, right? I mean, that's usually what it comes down to, right, for states. Like Indonesia still, was still working out what it meant to be, what indigeneity meant, right, in the national context. Uh, and so both were navigating these really delicate transitions uh, from imperial subjecthood to citizenship in which they had to manage conflicts both within and between groups. Um, uh, so Sadiq, again, writes about India that there were these two competing notions of use solely at the same time, one in which use solely establishes a spirit of constitutional equality, and another in which it was a tool for reifying hierarchies in India's multi-ethnic community. Um, so this is not just about foundational moments uh, as much as it is also about post-colonial moments. Uh, compare this to Argentina and Brazil, who already a century earlier adopted use solely as a strategy to increase mainly European pop immigration, um, removing as many barriers as possible to make um, settlement achievable. So kind of an economic rationale. So to sum up this point, we as a field can think more deliberately about foundational moments, post-colonial contexts and economic needs, not as residual cases or outliers to existing theories, but is fertile ground for novel theorization. Um, so uh, this means we expand our data sets to, as we expand our data sets to include more country years, we also need to be careful in our steps of moving from analysis to interpretation. So uh, in addition to, but not unrelated to foundational moments, uh, the second context that is certainly relevant for thinking about theories of citizenship is democracy itself. So many of these post-colonial countries were faced with simultaneous tasks of statehood and democratization, um, but we can attempt to kind of disentangle them with some of the Western European cases studies that are often um, uh, used, but which, which offer sufficient variation when it comes to democratic quality over time. Hats off to Hungary. I love that presentation. Um, and it allows us to think both critically and theoretically about the relationship between uh, democracy and citizenship access. So there's a clear correlation. Um, as more states become democratic, more states adopted inclusionary citizenship practices. Um, 
including you solely dual citizenship tolerance, some of the things uh, Martin showed earlier uh, this morning, lowering of some of the barriers to naturalization. Um, but does democracy create pressure for inclusion? When and why did, demo did democratic norms create pressures for inclusion, right? State obligations, is it the correlation that is, is the correlation sp spurious? Like this, these are just like a lot of questions, right? That uh, the field is really ripe kind of for answering. I have two intuitions in thinking about how democratic moments might affect citizenship policy. And, you know, it's back and forth. And I spent just a bunch of time testing these relationships and realized that, like, we just still need, you know, more and better data, which I think the second panel, my timeline's really fuzzy from today, but those, those great papers together was you know, about VDEM and, and, and the data sets. Yeah, the VDEM papers. Okay. So um, on the one hand, uh, democracies might feel driven or bound, right, by norms of expansion and inclusion, uh, particularly if prior experiences deep closure and authoritarianism. So especially if that's like along sectarian or uh, ethnic lines. So like this inclusive pressure. This may be through like congressional consensus or courts or um, driven by expat communities. So I think we heard like two of those three one of those three examples today, right? So India, Israel, and South Africa, respectively. Um, though, in thinking about like that really good, what's it called? Um, calling the masses, right? David Fitzgerald and um, uh, Cook Martin's book, right? So they observe, right, that um, democracies was the first to uh, select immigrants by race. So um, inclusion is conditional, even in the best of circumstances. So one impulse is that democracies might feel this pressure to include. Um, it may also be the case that we see inclusion among uh, national minorities and not among immigrant outsiders. So I think there is a, a tilt in sort of the studies uh, so far as to think about inclusion in outsiders when outsiders are very much the national minorities within populations that lack voting rights or access um, to political rights. Um, so like this bias towards inclusion, I think, um, also then leads to the second intuition, which suggests that democracies, especially new and fragile ones, uh, may not only desire, but require a certain degree of closure. So this is drawing not from the citizenship literature, but from the democracy literature. Um, so this is especially true in fragile democracies um, that uh, when um, they're vulnerable to dissolution or to capture, right? So, uh, in uh, the rhetoric of reaction, Albert Hirschman writes broadly uh, rejecting uh, prerequisites of democracy, uh, proposing instead kind of a probabilistic perspective, uh, but um, sort of then I guess it was a couple of years later, uh, Dankwart Rusta wrote this essay about transitions to democracy, where he writes about the imperative of a reasonably coherent state as a prerequisite. So what does a reasonably what does coherent state mean? It, uh, he meant it in the terms of national unity, where people must agree that they are a political entity, at least enough that there's no uh, secessionary movement. Um, this is something that John Stuart Mill wrote about like a hundred years earlier. Um, he wrote, it's a general, it's, it is in general a necessary condition of free institutions that the boundaries of government should coincide in the main with those of nationalities. So unity is uh, necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, both of these intuitions, right, that democracy creates pressures for inclusion and democracy creates uh, uh, an imperative for closure, both of these are testable, we just need more data. And so this is kind of why I think about the importance of concept stretching and uh, theory building as we enlarge our data sets, right, that there are so many questions. Um, I think I put it at some point, a sport metaphor, which makes me very uncomfortable, but um, that there's still a lot on the field. That's, that's the most sport you're gonna get out of me. Um, that there's just a lot of questions that we can ask and answer now. Uh, so last on the topic of democracy and theory, um, citizenship in non-democratic contexts simply looks and is different. Uh, so while we can compare citizenship across regime type, they are fundamentally different in that citizens are only a institutional constitutive feature of democracy in that they are the source of sovereignty, replacing age old concepts of subjecthood or divine right. If we understand democracy as a system of government based on competitive elections, so Adam Jaworski's definition, uh, citizen voting is the mechanism putting people into office. And then building, of course, on this core insight is Dahl's, uh, Robert Dahl's intervention uh, that citizens not only participate in elections, thus choosing the government and validating a regime as democratic, 
regime is reciprocal, reciprocally, reciprocally, it's, it's now word say satiation and I can't say it now, reciprocally. Okay, you know what I mean? In return, the regime uh, is accountable to citizens, uh, giving them meaningful rights, rights that non-democratic systems do not and cannot grant. So these are kind of fun, the individual, the citizen has a fundamentally different responsibility and relationship to democracy as they then to non-democratic regimes. The bottom line is that those who get to be a citizen matter greatly, but for different reasons than it matters in autocracies. And, and this is a very important and, which we also saw today, there are more autocracies today than democracies. So we really need more theory, generalizable theory on citizens in autocracies. Um, Comparing policy outcomes across regime type may produce statistically significant but substantively meaningless results. So I did promise three observations and the first two were rather verbose. Um, so I keep the last one very short. The third observation is that there's just a lot that we don't know. Um, specifically, I think uh, we don't have a mechanistic understanding about how citizenship works. Yes, we know what the rules are. Yes, we know the length of time an immigrant might spend in a civic orientation course or the level of language acquisition. We may be able to track employment status, et cetera. But what if we understand citizenship? But if we understand citizenship as national belonging, how do these features produce that? So how does citizenship work to produce cultural integration or social integration. Does course attendance produce belonging because it teaches certain materials, because it encourages cross-group socialization, or because it just takes a long time and increases exposure? Does citizenship produce feelings of cultural belonging because individuals are treated differently with naturalization or insider status, or because they see themselves differently, right? Is it a psychological process where membership improves self-esteem for social identity theory? or where completing requirements provides a type of task satiation. Uh, simply put, uh, here it is, the sports metaphor. There's a lot of knowledge left on the field. <laughs> In a sense, this is the hardest task of all. This requires speaking to and observing vulnerable populations at scale. Uh, it's hard and it's careful work. And, um, and I hope that uh, we as a field can either do the work or encourage graduate students to do the work. Um, but it also, I think, and this is from the perspective of political science, um, it means building explicit bridges with disciplines like sociology and anthropology that do this kind of work regular, regularly. Uh, if we want to know what citizenship is and does, we need to center the voices of those who actively seek and practice it. Okay, so what I have presented tonight is a series of observations that may seem a little grumpy, uh, I've been told. I've been called grumpy. Um, on concepts, I illustrated how uh, with too much extension, you lose intention and produce stretching. On theory, I observed that we have more data than ever, but we're not adding to cumulative theoretical knowledge because we are hemmed in by scope conditions and limited casework. And on knowledge frontiers, I argued that there's still so much to explore, primarily mechanisms of citizenship, and I could go on. <laughs> um, but uh, let me be clear, none of these observations derogate what we have or require throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, rather, I think they're all invitations to think more critically and generatively, again, to use that term, about how we use concepts and theories, uh, where they may be portable, and what their scope limitations are. This invites us to be inductive and interdisciplinary in moving forward, constructing theories that describe the vast majority of global cases, not the minority of cases that give centuries of data. So I view this exercise as an observation. I'm sure I understand. Let me explain it. Okay, so um, so this is this exercise and observation is ultimately an act of optimism. Um, it is only by doing the hard work of kind of trekking through the mountains that you can map out the water's edge, so to speak, to explore the sea. And I just want to say that it is a real pleasure to hear your work today and to reiterate that comment from earlier uh, because I can just see like so many new avenues moving forward together. So thank you. Thank you, um, Sarah, um, for excellent um, thoughts and actually uh, pushing us to um, 
to think about um, yeah, what we do with the data, what we want to do with it, uh, what can we compare? So there are lots of uh, questions on the uh, on the table, and we have some time to uh, discuss this um, now, about um, 20 minutes, and also to pick that up um, well, over dinner and tomorrow uh, in the remaining session. So um, just raise your hand if, uh, if you want to ask a question. And um, we go uh, Elisa, Gezim, uh, Reiner, then uh, in the first round, and we do Jelena, uh, Adio. Elisa, you go first. So I have a bit of a cheeky question. Um, all of your provocations are very similar to the provocations made in my field of constitutional law in the last decade or so, encouraging going beyond the usual suspects, being deeper and more careful with theory development um, and stretching the boundaries of what we're doing to ask more questions rather than just looking inwards. So then the cheeky question I have is, do you think um, publishers are ready for this? Would you recommend any particular outlets given you know, all of the work that you've published that will be more attuned and receptive to pushing the boundaries of the field? I don't think it's cheeky at all. I think it's like, it is the question, right? I mean, when I refer to disciplinary incentives, that is very much kind of uh, one of the things I had in mind. I do think, I don't think that the, the barrier is case-based. I think that that's a misconception about what editors want. I think that it is very much about um, uh, methodology. I still think the methodology is the barrier. And so that's why when I wanna think constructively, it's, it's, it's about um, marrying not just sort of casework, uh, new, new cases into sort of, and pushing new theory, but in terms of uh, multi-method work as well. And so, you know, when I, I guess, look at the, 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 the field in terms of uh, migration journals, but also general journals, I think that they're more open than ever to, um, particularly to different, uh, so, I mean, at least in the US, we co if you study any sort of immigrant or minority class, we code it as race and ethnic politics, which is somehow different than what happens in every other country in the world on, for some reason. Um, but, you know, I, I see that there's more interest than ever in, in publishing on different topics and different in, in, in different countries. And I think the field has been very reflective of, of sort of the, um, the underrepresentation of certain countries, but I, I, the barrier is still qual quant. I, I, unfortunately, I think Eleanor will probably attest that as well as she, where is she? Is, is a qualitative scholar in a methodology department doing a open-ended survey analysis here, yeah. Uh, Gazim. Uh, thanks a lot, fascinating talk. So I just, I mean, I, I like the point you made about the, the fact that there are more authoritarian states today and then kind of also we need to study them, but also try to theorize and generalize based on that. I guess there is one challenge there in the sense that we focus a lot on states, but not so much on kind of the bottom up on, on citizens. And I think with a growing number of dual citizens, we have a lot of more cases now where people can be non-national residents of democratic states and citizens on author of authoritarian states. So they live in this kind of in-between position. So citizenship is it's not a, a static fixed position but keeps changing quite a lot. So I guess the challenge would be then how do we study autocratic states in conjunction with democratic states by focusing on citizens as individuals who navigate their way between the two types of entities. So it was more of a comment than the question. Yeah. It, it is a comment I acknowledge, it is true. I think a lot of people are starting to study though, kind of uh, the opportunities for political act mobilization uh, living in democratic contexts with respect to diaspora politics, right? Um, the name escapes me at the minute, but uh, I think there's more, in, you would say a dyadic relationship, right? I mean, it would, I, think, I think that there's, that's really kind of a rich area of studying and how kind of uh, living in, dia it was a study on Turkey actually, now that I think about it, right? This sort of, in the experience of living in diaspora, it can, uh, specifically democratic diasporas that can kind of innervate um, uh, and mobilize uh, political active, political communities. I'm sorry, I'm really tired now. Um, Adio. Excellent talk, uh, Sarah. Uh, you just liked all the India shout outs. <laughs> no, I was, I was uh, really thinking because um, 
uh, the Mamdani book, uh, I read, but uh, you helped me to think about it. And especially I was thinking about, yes, like uh, just in the, the post-colonial state making and especially 1947. And after that, the first election that happened in 1951, the state had enormous um, responsibility to, uh, to basically see the citizens and basically identify the citizens. And at that time, uh, just solely, definitely uh, the idea helped a lot. And at the same time, because of the partition, there was so much uh, population exchange was happening between India and Pakistan. So that's why they kept the just sanguine as well to uh, basically about that question. Uh, but my question is again this i think uh, we all have to think about this that, that how from that the that initial promise that inclusive idea of citizenship that started with that uh, jail talks about from there onwards now uh, the question coming is how the democratic institutions like elections uh, election commission or uh, supreme court all these democratic institutions are slowly being used to disenfranchise or attempt to disenfranchise. And then the democratic majority is cheering that uh, at the same time. The, so is it in that case, don't you think that the, uh, your talk was on uh, the citizenship and the democratic moment, whether this democratic moment is also again turning back on this idea of citizenship? I mean, the way you described it could also be how one would describe living in the United States in 2022, right? That we use democratic institutions to deprive people of the vote. Um, like, you know, a lot of this external voting thing I was thinking about, uh, you know, when you, the difference between de facto and de jure, or, you know, between um, adoption and implementation, right? If we're all gonna quote Wel Wellman here, I'll just use her terminology, right? That uh, you make voting possible by law, but you don't set up any polling, any, you know, voter places in cities with major diaspora communities, right? So that, that you can use the, you know, there's a big gap between what the rules say and what you do. And so like, I think as much as we want to theorize the role between democracy and pressures for citizenship inclusion, I think there is also this reverse, the reverse is also true that, you know, and this is what I was trying to get at with the there are there are two imperatives that exist, right? The democracy creates pressures for inclusion, but democracy also has some sort of, and, and people talk about different ways, some sort of um, imperative for closure. This is not to say exclusion, but that there are parameter needs, right? What is the population who gets to vote, right? That requires defining a specific group and that is inherently an act of closure, right? And so democracy contributes in both ways. And again, this is, testable. I don't know the answer under what conditions it produces one outcome versus the other, but I think that these are the kinds of questions that we can use all sorts of cases for, not just the same cases, right? Yeah. So I have Rainer and then Jelena on the on my list. Are there others? Rainer, you go first. Yeah. So thanks, Sarah. This is very stimulating. I'm, I'm just still trying to make sense of your framework and uh, related to how I would think about this. When I do intro courses on citizenship, I always tell, the first thing I tell people is uh, it's two-faced. You all, a good theory of citizenship has to be able to talk about the external phase, which is what citizenship means in the international state system, as well as about the internal phase, what it means when, you know, in relation of governments to subjects or citizens. And the two things, you know, cannot be separated. So uh, with regard, if you, and, and again, there are two, so that's one distinction that's important. The second one is between more explanatory, uh, distanced, neutral scientific accounts and more normative uh, ideas about citizenship. On the, on the first level, if you have taken more distance to you and you ask what citizenship is doing in the international level, then basically uh, the answer is, well, it's about self-determination of states to determine who their own nationals are, right? And that explains a lot of the deficits and deficiencies uh, we, do, we are discussing this now with weaponization of citizenship and how weak international legal norms are in, uh, in, in fighting this kind of phenomenon. Uh, internally, and, and so there, and there is no big difference between democracies and, uh, and, and autocracies in this regard. You know? They both have the same right to self-determine who their nationals are. Internally, again, there is uh, a level where democracy and autocracy doesn't make much difference because governments want to use, as you say, citizenship to control populations. It's about governmentality, legibility of populations. It's, an it's a tool of the modern state to govern the society. Uh, 
Uh, and, uh, you know, it's used differently in autocracies and in democracies, but both do it in, in their different ways. And we have to be aware of the many kind of shades and, and grades where one, uh, you know, democracy slides into autocracy or the other way around. If you think about this normatively, it looks quite different. You know, normatively at the international level, it's about the right to have rights, as Aaron said. You know, which state is responsible to guarantee your most fundamental rights? This is what it ought to be. Yeah? But then the clash is with the de facto norm of self-determination. And if you look at it normatively as a, from a Athenian perspective, you know, citizenship about self-government and accountability of governments, then that's about the, where democracy comes in as a norm, right? And where you can say this is where uh, autocracies just uh, create subjects rather than citizens. But this is what we ought to, you know, in a way, be able to distinguish, you know, the descriptive uh, part and the normative part and the two faces. And that would be my fourfold typology in a way, where a good citizenship theory needs to be able to fill in all of these uh, quadrants. But that's, you know, just in reaction to what you're saying, I think we are not yet at the stage where we are really good in combining all of this. At least I'm, I'm constantly struggling in doing this. I completely agree with you, and I feel like we are rehashing the argument, not the argument, the discussion that we had at Sam's dissertation defense about combining empirical and, and uh, normative approaches uh, and thinking about how as a field we do this uh, together, right? And so, but I, I have one reaction, I think, to, um, to, to what, you, what you said, uh, and it's that I do think that and this is a methodological critique, I think, that um, by the fact that we have the two faces of citizenship, by the fact that it looks similar externally, I think that that's kind of used as cover to assume that it operates similarly internally. So that because it looks similar, it's just states assigning membership, states assigning status, let me be clear, right? That that makes it look similar Right, but we can't say that citizenship in China is the same by virtue of holding Chinese citizenship as it is in the United States. I'll just pick an example, right? If you are a rural citizen and you work in Shanghai, but you don't have hukou in Shanghai, you don't have your effective rights. It is regardless that you have, you know, it's irrespective that you have national citizenship. So by virtue of the fact that they look similar externally, I think it provides cover for some misinterpretation of how citizenship works internally. And there I find Tilly's definition to be really instructive in distinguishing between democracies and non-democracies on this front. So like when he, when Tilly defines it, Charles Tilly defines citizenship, it's this transactional relationship between an individual and a polity and they both have obligations and rights. So that's true in democracies. And so when we think it's not just citizen obligations to the state, but state has obligations to the citizens. So the state is not purely extractive. It has to provide certain rights, coverage, security, et cetera. And that's just not true cross nationally. So we observe with regime variation, different types of transactional relationships. And I think that that is also part of the theory building is that we need to think explicitly about how these different regime settings uh, influence that those transactional ties. Yelena. Um, thank you so much, Sarah, for this um, inspiring speech. And actually it's two kind of comments more to build up on what you were saying. And I liked very much your export versus import idea, where I think you're right in saying that we have to be aware of how we use concepts. And this is something that we've also discussed at Global Sit uh, in a working paper on using indicators to study citizenship globally. So we have to be uh, aware of how we use some terms uh, to study things in different concepts and, and their meaning in different terms. Exactly what you were saying about Chinese citizenship and the meaning of it as, as to where it was constructed. But I was also thinking, isn't it very similar to the ways in which we understand democracy? 
because it seems to me that when we, especially when we make the dif distinction democracy versus autocracy, we are perhaps oversimplifying it. And I think that that was uh, along the lines of one of the comments. But even if a country is an autocracy, it doesn't have the same shape, form, and it can evolve. And equally, democracies can go move forward and go backwards. So I think that perhaps we need to uh, make our thinking more flexible and perhaps to enrich the field, especially with insights uh, from the global south. Um, in nationalism studies, I recently read a really nice article by Harris Milonas and Maya Tudor, which state that it's kind of new knowledge, knowledge that advances the field will be produced uh, mostly by teaming up with local scholars and just exploring local knowledge and in a way rethinking the concepts that we use on a daily basis by engaging with scholarship that's out there somewhere in the global south or even in the peripheries, uh, peripheries of, of Europe. And I, the second thing I wanted to, to point out, I very much liked your idea of perhaps thinking more about symbolic and ideational elements of citizenship, those that symbolize national belonging. And I think that there is a bit of literature in terms of um, nation building in Eastern Europe that explores these topics. So perhaps also trying to engage with these streams of literature, which see it as a tool of nation building and trying to connect to how it has played out in the concept of Western European immigrant nations would perhaps be, be useful. And uh, I, I, I'd, I'd like to continue this conversation, perhaps also uh, building into the hierarchies of membership, but we can do that over, over dinner. Thank you. I'll just add real quickly. Um, you know, I thought a lot about variations in citizenship, like we think about variations in democracy, right? And, and a way to sort of conceptualize that, um, right? The difference is we have diminished subtypes in democracy. So we can use terms like electoral authoritarianism. We have hybrid regimes, we have terminology, we have conceptual, you know, terminological innovation to describe these different concepts, these, these gradations of democratic subtypes. But like, how do we conceptualize gradations of citizenship, right? Um, so we have the scale about inclusion and exclusion. This is like a, this is a very nerdy subfield conversation that I, I, Sam and I love to have, Martin and I love to have about like how you measure citizenship is it, like, is a 0.7 then like more inclusive than a 0.6? Like I could do this all day, but the point is, um, did we do this all day? No, but you know, the point being is that like, how do we think comparatively and, you know, not just across case, but you know, temporarily about inclusion and exclusion in terms of citizenship, and not just in terms of towards you know, citizenship laws are about outsiders, but it's about integrating these other groups that experience subtypes of citizenship. And this is again where like the way that you know, from the perspective of positivist political science, the field really does us a disservice because it's organized in such a way that if you study um, citizenship eligibility and access for immigrants, you sit like in this group. And if you study sub, you know, um, hierarchical citizenship, uh, secondary citizenship, et cetera, like the deprivation of rights among citizens, then you sit here, right? I mean, I have a lot of um, academic friends that study, you know, voting rights access among uh, black Americans and like our literatures don't intersect, but we're really talking about the same thing. Um, and then, you know, related to that, you know, Harris wrote an entire book about nation building in the Balkans and didn't study citizenship. Like, so I think, you know, that's a very interesting movement of, I think, parallel literatures. You know, I think he even calls a chapter, like, how do you count people? Like, I know how you count people, but like, we talk about counting people really differently. And so I think there's just more opportunities, right, to have intersections among the parallel lines, to make them less parallel. Yeah, that would be, yeah. Well, I think on that, um... Constructive Elegant note. Um, we are going to um, call an end to this session, and uh, many thanks, uh, Sarah, for for sharing your thoughts on how to move forward. And we look forward very much to your um, annual review piece. Um, do you know when it's coming out? May. Uh, May twenty three. Yeah. So it's like. 
Okay, so we so we look forward to uh, to seeing your piece and uh, very much um, thank you for sharing your uh, your ideas and and thoughts with us and um, we will um, yeah we are delighted that we are here today with a group of uh, citizenship scholars from all over the world and from actually different different disciplines uh, law political science uh, and other disciplines um, and still finding common ground to talk to each other and um, I think your yeah your message is very clearly understood that. Um, it's very good that we can talk to each other, but we have to also make sense that we actually that are points where we yeah where we um, where we understand each other and 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 we should yeah we should also make sure that um, um, yeah those common understandings of course um, allow us to move the field forward in terms of uh, generalizing some of these understandings right so there is also a danger in maybe being. Uh, too much uh, stuck to your own discipline or your own context, uh, because that would, of course, um, not allow us to move uh, forward. So um, there are many thanks for your thoughts. And um, this is the end of the, uh, the first day of the uh, Global CIT um, Annual Conference 2020. Um, so we close the, uh, the video recording and a logistic uh, message for everyone who is in the room here that the uh, shuttle that will bring you back to the hotel will be ready at 6.30. Um, so we end with an applause for Sarah. Thank you.